Welcome to the module about delivery formats, dither, and data compression. And so before we get into this topic, I want to just review a few things that we already know about delivery from earlier modules. One thing that we saw is that when sample values are recorded or stored, this always happens with a finite amount of detail. We have a sampling rate and a bit depth. We saw that the sampling rate primarily influences the range of frequencies that can be recorded or stored. And so one consideration we might take out of that is that we want to avoid unnecessary sample rate conversion because it might introduce artifacts into the sound. We saw that the bit depth is closely related to digital noise introduced by recording or storage. And basically, for every extra bit of bit depth you have, that digital noise, that quantization noise, goes down by six more decibels. So one strategy that we have to optimize the delivery of digital audio is to normalize projects when we finish them so that their peak sample is really, really close to the top but not, exa not exactly at the top. For example, minus 0.3 decibels full scale. So our purpose for doing this normalization is to use the full resolution of the digital format to keep the details of our audio far away from that digital noise. Another strategy that we're likely to apply already during delivery of our audio projects is to manage the overall dynamic range, for example, by compression or limiting. This is separate from normalization. Even if we do them, do both of these things at approximately the same time. And this is a useful part of getting a project ready to deliver. Its purpose is to make it easier for the quieter parts of the audio signal to be audible in real-world listening environments, which typically have a bunch of noise in them. So what we're going to do now is talk through some additional considerations that often apply when we're getting digital audio projects ready to deliver to someone else, to an audience. And so the first one is to think about full resolution files, which we've already been using a lot in this course. The typical examples of full resolution audio files would be the WAV and the AIFF format. Now with these files, every sample measurement goes directly into the file and it can be read back from it exactly. And the files themselves consist of a tiny little bit of header information, metadata, and then the rest of the file is just bits that are piled up representing the samples. And so the size of these files is very predictable from their duration, sampling rate, bit depth, and number of channels. For example, if we have 60 seconds of stereo audio at 48 kilohertz, 24 bits, and each second in one channel then is 48,000 times 24 bits, that means each second in one channel is going to be 1,152,000 bits per second. So in two channels, it'll be twice that, or 2,304,000 bits per second. And if we have 60 seconds of that, it's going to be a total of 138,240,000 bits. Um, now each um, byte, which is a more common measurement of data, in computers and so forth is 8 bits. So if we take the number 138,240,000 and we divide it by 8, we get 17,280,000 bytes, which is approximately 16 and a half megabytes. So if we look at a, a, a stereo audio file that's in the WAV format, 48 kilohertz, 24 bits, we expect it to be very close to 16 and a half megabytes. Um, that's a lot of data for for a real, relatively short amount of sound. So another full resolution delivery format besides the WAV and AIFF format that's important to know about is the CD audio format. This is, it's an important format because historically it was this format that made digital audio an artifact of widespread domestic consumption and enjoyment starting in the 1980s. And so the history of that technology and people's experience with it, with it has influenced the kinds of things that people say about digital audio. And I think the, the lower quality 
of some of the digital audio devices of that time, the fact that it was often 16 bits, and um, perhaps the nature of some of the strategies that audio producers and engineers were working with at that time has led to the stereotype of digital audio as, as cold um, or as synthetic or artificial. Uh, and I don't think that that's necessarily a fair uh, assessment of what is possible and common with digital audio in our time. The CD audio format, interestingly enough, was chosen by an executive at Philips in order to be able to fit Beethoven's Ninth Symphony onto a single disc. And the parameters that they came up with are that it's stereo, two channels, it's 16 bits per sample, and it's a 44,100 hertz sampling rate. So a question that is useful to consider about this is if we were making now something for an audio CD, what sampling rate and bit depth would we use for recording? Now you might be tempted to say, well, we'll match the format. We'll go stereo 16 bits, 44,100 hertz. But I don't think that that's the right answer. Um, I think that we would record with certainly at least a sampling rate of 44,100 hertz. That, that's OK, although we could use a, a higher one as long as we use good sample rate conversion. But I don't think we want that 16-bit bit depth in our recording. I think we would record with 24 bits or even higher if it's available to us um, so that that digital noise is as far away in our project from, from being audible as possible. And then there are things we can do when we are getting this audio ready to go onto the CD that can mask the digital noise that's introduced by virtue of this being a 16-bit format. So to make this slightly long story short, we should continue to record and work with higher resolution formats. And then when it comes time to deliver this to the place where they're going to manufacture the CD, only at that time would we down mix or render this things render the, our audio down to the lower resolution CD audio format. So there are also lossy compression formats that are common. For example, MP3, Apple Audio Codec or AAC, and Audge Vorbis. Now these formats are addressing the problem that full resolution formats involve a lot of data. And the way they work is algorithms decompose the audio signal into different components or frequencies, and then some of these are discarded, not stored, depending on how relevant they are to our perception. And then the least relevant are discarded first until the desired amount of data remains. And then during listening or playback, the components are turned back into audio signals and mixed together. The quality of the results that you get from this can vary widely depending on how much data is kept, but also depending on how the algorithm's decision about what is relevant relates to what's in the signal. Generally speaking, these lossy compression algorithms favor vocal and musical sounds. So the further the sounds that are in the signal get away from those favored sounds, the less likely they're going to be considered to be relevant, and the more likely they're going to be discarded first as the amount of data goes down. Some other delivery formats we should consider. Um, there are lossless compression formats. So these are formats that also address the problem of audio data taking up a lot of space, but they compress it in a way that the, the original data is exactly recreatable. And the most common example of, this for, of a lossless compression format for audio is FLAC, or free lossless audio compression format. But it's hardly popular. You'll see um, boutique and audio file recordings released in the FLAC format. Um, definitely it's an economical way of, of recording um, and reproducing and transmitting and storing audio exactly, uh, but it's not widely supported. It's also very common for audio to be included within a larger container format that appears to most audience or end users as a quote-unquote video file. Now the audio in this case may be in a full resolution format. It might be a lossy compressed format or much more rarely, it might be in a lossless compression format. Vinyl is an increasingly popular delivery format. It's certainly capable of um, producing very high quality audio signals in a way that lasts a long time, although it does change over time 
and it does the nature of the signal does change with repeated listening as well vinyl is very expensive and complicated to make but um, there are lots of music lovers that swear by it we're also in our time seeing a resurgence of the tape cassette which in some ways is the opposite of vinyl it's not generally a very high quality format because the the width of the tape that is used the magnetic tape that is used is very small so it has definitely has problems with noise and degradation over time in a way that I think is more severe than vinyl but unlike vinyl tape cassettes are possible to make uh, at home with very do-it-yourself methods and so I think that they are um, they're they are one of the preferred delivery formats for different kinds of, um, of independent music production. So dither is another strategy we need to know about during the delivery of projects. We've already seen that every time a new audio signal is recorded or stored, digital noise is added at around approximately minus six decibels per bit in the bit depth. And one way of dealing with this problem that we've really we've already been applying throughout the course is having more bits. Nowadays, with 24-bit technologies being very common, that's often all we really need. But if for some reason we have fewer bits in our bit depth, for example, if we're rendering something that's meant to be pressed onto an audio CD at 16 bits, or if we're going to be repeatedly changing and storing very detailed signals, like rendering something, doing something to it, rendering it again, doing something to that, rendering that again, doing something to that. In this case, in those cases, dither is going to be an important strategy. And basically what it does is plugins or other software processes are used to add special types of noise to the signal that make the digital noise less obvious and or unpleasant. Um, so other no noise is added in order to mask the digital noise. I'll note just tangentially that digital audio hardware, for example, analog to digital converters that we've been using in various ways throughout this course because they're built into our recording devices, that hardware typically has dither built into it as a design consideration. And it's one of the reasons why different hardware might produce recordings that sound different in subtle ways because different hardware may dither in subtly different ways. The bottom line about dither dither is that the main situation where most of us will need to use it to consciously add it will be when rendering projects to lower bit depths example for an audio CD at 16 bits so to summarize what we talked about in this module we looked at a range of different delivery formats full resolution files CD audio lossy compression formats lossless compression and audio inside video container formats we talked a bit about how lossy compression works. Algorithms discard components of the audio that are less relevant in order to use less data during storage and transmission. And we looked at dither, which is a special strategy. Noise is deliberately added to mask digital noise. This is mostly useful in situations where audio is being rendered at lower bit depths. Thanks for listening, and talk to you soon.